Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Japan America Society of Georgia's dinner and a movie series, uh, where we will tell you a little bit about a movie, uh, then you will enjoy a meal related somehow to the movie, uh, watch the movie, and then afterwards we can have a live uh, discussion. So the first film in our series that we're going to cover is the film that's titled in English, Departures, um, which is, uh, I, I, without giving it away, a very interesting name. It was definitely a difficult one for the translators to figure out how to translate it. The Japanese uh, translation is okuribito, uh, meaning sending off people, which uh, actually that becomes important in the uh, in the text or of the of the film in the script. So let's talk about it a little bit uh, first. It was released in 2008. That makes it 12 years old at this point. Wow. Uh, the only really uh, telling thing that you'll notice that it's 2008 is the uh, cell phones that everyone is using. They're not using smartphones. They're using uh, flip phones, uh, which were late to be adopted in Japan because Japanese flip phones uh, were such high quality and so functional that the advantages of a smartphone were minimal for Japanese users. Uh, it's certified fresh uh, by Rotten Tomatoes. Uh, gets a 92% audience score. It's one of my favorite films. Uh, Roger Ebert, the late Roger Ebert, gave it a 100 score. Um, so he very much enjoyed it as well. Uh, it's always good to have uh, someone famous who feels the same way that you do. It made 70 million in the box office, but almost 98% of that was foreign revenue. So this was not a huge hit film in Japan. If you look at the, uh, in the upper right hand corner here for the uh, advertising uh, poster, uh, you can see that it was released on the 13th of September, which was a Saturday uh, in Japan, which is not really uh, prime time for uh, movie watching in Japan, although I, they may have been trying to capitalize on the, um, you know, there is a cluster of holidays in the spring called Golden Week, and there is a more recent cluster of holidays in the month of September called Silver Week, um, which that may have been what they were trying to, to capitalize on. But again, not a, a a huge time for box office uh, positioning. So most of the money that was made on the film was made uh, internationally. That said, the film was not made for an international audience. It was made uh, for a Japanese audience. It was actually based on a book by a person who actually uh, did what this person did, uh, what the main character does. Um, which we'll talk about it in a second. It did win the Academy Award, the Oscar for Best Foreign Language Film in 2009. It was the first Japanese film officially to do so. There were other Japanese films that were honored prior to this, uh, the work of Kurosawa, for example, uh, but those were not uh, awarded the Oscar for Best Foreign Language Film, most of them because of timing, because the, there was not uh, a category at the time. Uh, and so it was really a big deal uh, in Japan uh, to win this. So um, you can see the uh, the director and the two main characters in the lower right hand corner uh, having received their their Oscar. Okay, mostly this is a mostly spoiler free synopsis so that you know what's going on. The main character Daigo, who is the uh, gentleman that we saw in the middle uh, on the the of the people gathered at, at the Oscars, played by, uh, uh, <clears throat> right, let's, let's back up here. Oop. Oh, no, wait, okay. The main character, Daigo, has returned to his hometown in the bucolic countryside of Yamagata Prefecture. Uh, if you've not been to Yamagata, I highly recommend going. It is uh, beautiful, it's mountainous, it's borders on the Japan Sea. Uh, it really has a very authentic uh, Japanese feel um, it needs more tourism, um, definitely, uh, but the fact that it is not favored by tourists actually uh, makes it, increases the charm rather than decreases it. 
So he has a dream of becoming a concert cellist, but it has not panned out. This is taken care of very early in the movie. So it's mostly spoiler free. And he and his young wife move into a snack bar that he inherited when his mother passed away. He has to find a job, but his prospects are limited because he's a trained cellist. And if you're not in playing in a concert orchestra, there are not a whole lot of jobs for trained cellists, unfortunately. So he has to find a job in Yamagata, which is also a location that the, the rural areas of Japan have been in economic malaise. Now it's called the Ushiniwarada Sedai or Jidai, uh, or well, Sedai, uh, generate, it's now called the Lost Generation. Uh, it started out in the 1990s, were called the Ushiniwarada Junen, the Lost Decade. But the economic malaise after the 1989-1990 uh, asset bubble failure, Japan just has never really fully recovered from that. And places that have suffered the most under that uh, economic situation have been rural areas like Yamagata. So not a whole lot of jobs, certainly not jobs for someone who is a cellist. He finds a strangely worded um, classified ad in the newspaper and he, re he responds to the ad and he winds up working as an encoffiner, which is a professional person who places a deceased person's, who places deceased persons in coffins in preparation for cremation. The job pays very well. But because of societal pressures, which we'll cover in a second, he doesn't tell anyone what he does. So his wife doesn't know, no one around him knows what he does. So again, our main characters, Kobayashi Daigo, played by Motoki Masahiro. Um, you can see him with a cello there. Uh, Kobayashi Mika, who is played by uh, Hirosue Ryoko, and uh, Sasaki Ikue, who is the CEO of the uh, encoffining company, the president of the CEO of the uh, encoffining company, played by Yamazaki Tsutomu. You may have seen, if you've watched other Japanese films, all three of these actors are very prolific. Um, and uh, one, particularly uh, Yamazaki Tsutomu, uh, you may have seen because he was uh, very heavily favored by the late uh, Itami Juzo, uh, who is another excellent director. Uh, Japanese director. Uh, he was uh, one of the stars of the movie Tom Popo, for example. So if you're looking at him and you feel like he looks familiar, uh, yes, that there's a reason why, because he's been in so many different films. Um, and Hiroshi Oedyoko and uh, Motoki Masahiro have both been in a great many of, of Japanese films as well. Um, I wanted to point out that this film is kind of like going to make a very strange comparison. This film is kind of like Deadpool. In that, just like Deadpool was Ryan Reynolds' personal passion project that took him a while to get done, and it was driven mainly by him, because he felt that he wanted to tell the story of the superhero, uh, or super anti-hero Deadpool, correctly. Uh, Motoki Masahiro uh, read the um, diary of an encoffiner and decided that he wanted that to be made into a movie and he could find no one who was willing to direct and no one who was willing to produce and it just never fit into his schedule but he continued to labor on it for uh, by some estimates as long as 10 years to get this film made so um, I think while of course the tone of the films is very different uh, I think that you can see when somebody's really committed to a project, you do tend to get a higher quality uh, finished result. Now, the important thing to when you're watching the film, and, and I think the benefit of this film, this is why I do show it uh, to my MBA students. Uh, it doesn't have anything to do with business, but there are cultural touchstones uh, that I think the, the film does an excellent job of uh, explaining. One of the Japanese concepts that you will hear discussed a lot is honne versus tatemai. Your tatemai is the face that you show to the outside world, whereas your honne is 
your true feelings. Now, all people, all societies do this. This is not uniquely Japanese. What makes this particularly representative of the Japanese is the dichotomy between the outer face that one shows to society and one's inner feelings are really, the differences are really, really, really stark. And I, when you watch the film, you will understand that when people say things, they are probably feeling something radically different and that separation between what is spoken on the outside and what is actually felt on the inside, it's the way that they demonstrate that is a very Japanese way of doing that. And it is featured a lot in the film, which one can imagine in a film that deals with uh, death and dying, that that would, would come up a great deal. But again, Every culture has this to a greater or lesser degree. American culture, particularly culture in the American South, I think has a lot of familiar uh, similarities between the Hone and Tatemai. Uh, very famously, the Southern uh, example of saying, why bless your heart, um, sounds on the surface, the Tatemai sounds very uh, pleasant and very kind and polite but in really, in reality, it hides daggers on the inside. That, that I think, is the closest comparison that I can draw. Also, I want you to understand the differences between vocalization and communication. Um, it has been said by many that when Westerners, including Americans, want to get a hundred ideas across, they will make 130 or 140 utterances. So you say 130, 140 things to get 100 ideas across. The Japanese, on the other hand, are very, very big on nonverbal communication. And that also happens a lot in this film. There's a lot of nonverbal communication that is going on, that people are communicating with each other. Uh, and in fact, there's one scene, I won't give away which scene it is, but there's one scene where there's a very long period where there is no there's no vocalization at all or just minimal vo vocalization but there is a actually several points but there's a huge amount of communication going on you can see emotions you can you know pe people are able to communicate with each other so Vocalized thoughts and communication are two separate things. Um, for prototypical American communication, most of our vocalized thoughts are attempts at communication. So you might have like say a beloved aunt who shows her displeasure simply by raising her eyebrow or something like that. But that seems to be outside of the norm. Typically in America, if we want to express an idea, we will say that out loud, possibly many times. In Japan, on the other hand, first off, the number of vocalized thoughts is smaller than what is attempted to be communicated. communicated. And then the overlap between what kind of thought, what you're saying and what you're trying to communicate, there's not as much overlap. There's a lot of formulaic expressions that really aren't intended to express what the person's really feeling. They're simply there as a social lubricant. Um, and sometimes people are expected to understand things simply from the basis of, you know, the context in which everybody's looking at you or they're not looking at you or there are so many uh, non-verbal ways in which uh, Japanese people communicate, and they are just as important and just as valid as the vocalized thoughts. Now, why uh, does he keep his occupation secret? Well, it's, I'm sorry for not such a good segue there, but in Japan, traditionally, 
there it was a caste system. This took different forms. Uh, historically, uh, it it grew over a long period of time, but the the Tokugawa period or the Edo period, Tokugawa named for the ruling shogun of family, the Tokugawa shoguns, Edo period named for the city where the Tokugawa shoguns based their uh, military government, uh, Edo, which today is called Tokyo. Under, that's when this system became most uh, ensconced. And they talk about, in Japan, they talk about it as the Shino Kosho. The Shino Kosho actually refers to the four levels of the pyramid in the middle. Because you don't put, you don't talk about the emperor or the imperial family because he's the emperor, doesn't need to be talked about. It is known under the traditional system that the emperor is above everybody else. Not the case today, but traditionally, of course, the emperor was at the top. And even when the shoguns were ruling Japan, the shoguns officially ruled in the name of the emperor, although the emperor really had no effective power during most of the periods of shogun old reign, uh, most importantly being during the Tokugawa period that we just talked about, which went from 1603 to 1868. Below the emperor were feudal lords who may have been related to the imperial family, but may not have been, at least not directly related to the imperial family. And they, of course, were also high enough in the social structure that they didn't need to be referred to. So when you start dealing in the middle, you have people, you have the, the samurai who served the feudal lords, and they were higher than basically everybody except for the, the feudal lords and the emperor. Um, samurai had incredible privilege, and they were the people who had the weapons and the ability to fight and the authorization to kill people, uh, including people of any lower caste with impunity. Uh, so of course they were at the top, but underneath them, because you gotta eat, were the farmers. The farmers were elevated to a point immediately below the samurai in that uh, because they produced the food, they produced the rice and everything else that people uh, uh, could eat. And so they were, and generally they would have land that would it wouldn't belong to them, but they would be the, the titular holders of the, the land. Uh, so immediately below, also, uh, the amount of rice, rice was basically a substitute for wealth. A feudal holding, the Lord needed the samurai to control it, but he needed the farmers to produce great amounts of food, typically rice, because that would be how he would get wealth. Uh, wealth was actually counted uh, by how much rice you produced, and uh, it was called a, a koku, and that basically was the amount of rice that one person was to consume for one year, was a koku, and that, how many koku your, your holdings produced uh, was a symbol of your wealth. Uh, so the farmers were there higher. Then below them were the artisans and craftsmen, because you need people to produce swords and armor, but you also need people who make cabinetry and build buildings and bridges and all of these other things. Uh, so you need them as well. And then at the bottom were the merchants. The merchants were put at the bottom of this caste system because they were seen as not producing anything. They don't create anything. They're not servants of the feudal lord and they don't create anything. So they were viewed inherently with suspicion. But you can see where you would get an imbalance here because out of these groups, who's going to wind up with all the money? The merchants. The tea merchants, the you know the the, the paper merchants, the uh, the the clothier merchants, they had people. They would purchase uh, things that were made by the artisans and craftsmen or the farmers, and then they would resell them. 
that was seen as an unimportant and not particularly honorable position, but those people wound up with all the cash. So if you're a merchant and you have all this money and you can't climb the caste system yourself because these were set, what do you do? Well, you try to marry your family into a higher caste. You try to climb up a caste. Also, there were sometimes uh, there were not a whole lot, but there were a few uh, cases where members of higher level caste samurai and feudal lords who fell on financial hard times would sell their lordship, their peership, to sometime, usually it was a merchant was the person who had the money to, to buy that from them to settle their debts. So the merchants were constantly uh, trying to, to climb uh, that way through uh, arranged marriage as a, po uh, as a very popular way. Um, and of course, at different points in Japanese history, some people were able to be adopted into higher level uh, families as well. Uh, the great unifier Toyotomi Hideyoshi uh, was not, was born a commoner uh, somewhere in the Shinokosho system, uh, but he was adopted by a feudal lord and was able to become one of, effectively, he wasn't officially a shogun, but he effectively became the shogunal ruler of Japan. Below them, it's a long discussion of the Japanese caste system, below them were people, and I'm going to say these names, and I want to stress that these names are not considered, these are historical names, and today they are not considered appropriate names to use. Um, but these were names that were used at the time. There are things that need to be done for society that people don't really find that they want to do. And particularly with the influence of Buddhism, but also to some degree from Shinto as well, any connection with death at all so if you dealt in animal skins while you're touching dead animals, killing of animals is forbidden under uh, strict Buddhist doctrine at the time. So, but you got to make a taiko drum and what kind of skin are you going to put on the taiko drum? It's, you know, it's, it's going to be a, a, a cowhide most likely. Well, how do you get that? Well, you have to have somebody who deals with that. People, people die. Touching death, dealing with death was considered to be unclean, to be soiling. And, but there were still people who needed, obviously you have a need, people continue to die. They need to be taken care of uh, and they need to be uh, properly um, interred uh, or in this, uh, in most cases in Japan, uh, uh, to be um, cremated. So the people who worked in that industry as well were part of this group of people. They were called uh, eta, which is a very, it's, that's a slur, that's just a slur, but it was a term that meant basically human filth, or burakumin, which uh, is a really tricky, loaded question. Japanese people themselves don't use it very often. Uh, they, pref they prefer now the, the, the people who are part of this caste, they're still discriminated against in Japan. Uh, and, and they prefer to be called doa, meaning um, also Japanese. Uh, but the buraku mean, buraku means village or neighborhood and mean just means residence. And that's going to tie into what I'm going to tell you in about a second. So Google uh, got into, uh, in the early 2000s, got into huge trouble in Japan. And it was in part because of, they, they found something that was like, really cool. This is great. And they didn't understand the historical context of it. And it relates back to the, the caste system. Um, I believe it was Stanford University shared with Google their archive of 
historical Japanese uh, maps. Uh, in fact, they had a huge archive of historical maps from all over the world, but they particularly had a large one of Japanese maps. And so Google in Japan, they had their Google Maps feature. And what they found that was really cool was, hey, if we take these old maps and we overlay them on top of the current maps or even the current satellite images, you can see where things, you know, you can see from this picture very well. I mean, the, the main street used to be a canal. Uh, the uh, train, you can see the train station is built over what used to be a river. The neighborhoods still follow essentially the same pattern. And Google said, this is awesome. We can just create that as a layer in Google Maps and people can go through and they can say, oh, hey, what did this neighborhood look like in the 1700s? What Google was not aware of was that those neighborhoods had labels on them and the labels was not just, you know, in this one, this illustration I think is fine. It isn't just a name of who lived there. It isn't just a name of what was located in that space, but it also clearly indicated, remember back Burakumin uh, village, people lived in the village. It indicated where the Buraku were. So it immediately made the process very simple of connecting, hey, this person is from this house, which has been in this neighborhood, which has, and they've lived in that, their family's been there for many generations. And this used to be a place where those people lived. That may sound like to an American, like an obscure, you know, danger, but in Japan, that's a very common problem. And a lot of people who had been hiding their roots as a member of the Doa caste were suddenly outed against their will because people were now able to say, hey, you're from that neighborhood. Hey, you must be one of those. Not, not a good look. And Google uh, quickly took down the archive and disabled the feature. Um, so again, this is playing out in the real world. We need to talk a little bit about funeral etiquette because it does appear in the movie. So typically if you die uh, in Japan, your body will first be laid um, in the tokonoma in your family's house uh, or your traditional family home. Most Japanese family homes have a tokonoma and they might have a butsuda. A tokonoma is like a special area uh, in that will have, it will have woven straw mats. It will maybe, depending on the religious beliefs of the family that lives there, it might have a, a small Shinto shrine. It might have a Buddhist altar. It might have both because some Japanese people do that way as well. Um, so you can see here a person has been laid in the butsudan or in the, in the tokonoma in the house and people from the neighborhood will come by and pay their respects. Um, the person is, is underneath the flowers. This one's kind of fancy. That's a very fancy butsudan in the background, uh, a lot of gold and, and such, uh, but um, I've been to, to Japanese funerals, and this is generally the way that it goes. At first, you are laid, um, you are laid to rest uh, with your head facing to the north uh, in the tokonoma of your family home, uh, and everybody comes by and pays their respects to the body. Um, and there is a ceremony that goes on uh, for that. The amount of interaction with the deceased in Japan is a lot higher in my experience than funerals in the United States. Caskets are generally open. Uh, people interact rather closely. It's not uncommon to touch the body. 
Uh, it is not that uncommon, particularly for children, as is shown in this picture, to just not even really know, but, you know, that little girl's got her arm the whole way in the casket. Um, that's not, that's not uncommon. A um, little bit weird, but the body is just right there. And it is seen as a way of, for all to pay their last respects. When I lived in the rural part of Japan called uh, Tokushima, there was an expression that I learned there, and I don't know if it's unique to Tokushima or not, but it was uh, something along the lines of Ji-san uh, no Soshiki, Mago no Matsuri. The funeral for grandpa is a festival for the grandkids. Uh, because the idea being that the grandchildren, they get to see all these cousins that they haven't seen before. Uh, and it was kind of an expression of the idea that loss was also coupled with the joy of seeing relatives that you might not see on a, reg uh, on a regular basis, and maybe some who had come from far away. So the little kids not understanding what's going on uh, might actually be happy and cheerful, and this is not seen as a bad thing. It's just seen as natural. Uh, once the body is then taken out of the, out of the tokonoma and it's placed in a coffin, it is taken to a uh, cremation center where it is displayed for others who may not necessarily have had access to the home or might not have been able to to access the home in time are still able to uh, visit uh, and and have a viewing and most of the caskets come with a window so that you can see inside uh, again very much of uh, in people interacting and seeing and 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 internalizing, uh, saying their final goodbyes and internalizing that that person is no longer there. The casket is then placed in a uh, very elegant uh, uh, crematory. Uh, a uniformed uh, crematorium worker uh, will uh, burn the casket and the ashes. Uh, and you know, they, they are cremated. Virtually everyone in Japan, because of the lack of space, virtually everyone is cremated. Once you are cremated, uh, the remains are collected in an urn, and the bones, which are not destroyed in the process, are passed from family member to family member using a special set of ivory chopsticks. This is why, please always remember this, never, ever, ever, ever pass food from chopstick to chopstick. Because the only time the Japanese people pass anything from chopstick to chopstick is when they are passing the bones of their deceased relatives. If you pass food chopstick to chopstick, uh, you can understand why that's such an incredible faux pas. This is not an, this, this is a still from a television drama. This is not an actual cremation with the bones passing back and forth because nobody takes a photo of that. And finally, uh, your ashes and remains are placed in a family grave stone uh, in that large uh, square underneath the uh, rectangular one. The rectangular one generally has uh, the name, and maybe some things that are related to the family's uh, Buddhist beliefs. Um, and you can see the little uh, wooden placards as well. Uh, some people are uh, given uh, posthumous names uh, to uh, recognize their, um, you know, their, their names into the, the Buddhist world. Uh, so they're given uh, auspicious names uh, after death or yes after death by the um, by the temple that they particularly um, worship at this is not all sects of Buddhism some sects of Buddhism don't do that some do it's just a difference uh, also typically uh, people go to the family gravestone um, uh, probably three or four times a year 
There are particular holidays that are associated with this. Uh, Shimbun no hi and Shubun no hi, uh, the vernal and autumnal equinoxes, is a very common time to go visit the, uh, the grave uh, of the family. And in the summertime, the Obon festival. The Obon festival is when the spirits of the departed are believed to have come back. And when that period of time is over, uh, people will typically uh, visit the uh, family, um, the family uh, burial plot as well. Once that gets filled up, you have to move to a, you have to buy a new one and move to another one. And hopefully there's still space available. Um, but very few people receive individual um, burial. Very few people even receive an individual uh, commemorative memorial stone just for themselves with themselves cremated underneath it and to have an actual outright burial. Uh, particularly in the current era, very, very uncommon. So most people are buried and they're buried with their families. Okay, moving out of the death stuff, we're going to talk about bathing because uh, bathing is an important theme in this movie as well. Uh, in the movie, there will be featured a bathhouse. You may be familiar with the onsen, in Japan, uh, typically people do not uh, bathe in an onsen all the time. An onsen is seen as a special uh, uh, special thing. Uh, an onsen is special water. It's volcanic water that is heated uh, by magma near the Earth's surface. Uh, and it's naturally hot and contains dissolved minerals and all these sorts of things. And uh, onsen are wonderful and fantastic. And they do have a great deal of similarities with uh, the particular uh, with uh, the other bathing rituals. But this one that is shown here and the one that is featured in the movie is not a, an onsen, it's a sento. A sento, uh, literally it means a sen is like a retired version of a coin uh, that was basically to a, a sen is to a yen like a penny is to a dollar. There haven't been sen for a very long time in Japan because there's the value of a yen is somewhere around 100 yen to the dollar. Presently, I think it's 105, something like that. Uh, so by paying one sen, most Japanese houses didn't have uh, bathtubs or bathing facilities in them. So all communities would have a central bathhouse and people would go to the bathhouse and would uh, pay one coin and they would get to take a hot bath. Uh, you can see this one is uh, gender segregated. Uh, in general, I, I think gender segregation came on fairly quickly. It was definitely encouraged strongly uh, by the occupy, American occupying forces uh, after World War II. Prior to that, and even still to this day, there are some places, they're generally onsen, that have uh, shared bathing facilities. It's very, very, very uncommon. Uh, and sento because of the everyday nature of it, were gender segregated. A sento is typically owned by one family, and the way that it works is that there is a central person, usually on a raised platform, who can see into the disrobing areas of both sides to make sure that nobody's stuff gets stolen and such. And that's typically a very old Person. And this ties into how in Japan, I like to say that after you reach a certain age, traditionally people felt that you kind of stopped having gender. So you'll have one person looking into both sides uh, and accepting payment from people on both sides. And this is still how it works today. Uh, you pay that person uh, the money, which is today probably going to be a couple hundred yen uh, to take a bath. And they can also sell you, if you haven't brought bathing supplies, they can sell you, uh, soap is generally provided for free, but they can sell you a towel and things like that. Uh, little disposable towels. I have a, a nice collection of, of towels, not from Sento, from Onsen, but it's the same idea. You put your stuff, you get naked, put your stuff into the locker, and then you go in and you wash yourself off. Uh, typically there are stools to sit on and there are uh, traditionally, there were wash tubs before they got really big into shower uh, units. Uh, 
the wash tub was used to to rinse yourself off and for cleaning and you can see in the background those are the large tubs you do not ever get into the main tub soapy or dirty because everybody uses the same water for soaking or okay if it's gender segregated then everybody of that gender that bath water is only changed once a day because it's so much water so it's very important to get clean before you go in the tub you can also see in the background and uh, there are some wonderful um, collections of photographs uh, coffee table books etc of uh, by japanese photographers uh, really uh, drawing the murals on the back of a sento uh, became an art form particularly in the 1930s, 19, maybe not so much in the 1940s, definitely the 1950s and 60s. And those are painted by hand, and there are people who actually uh, do those, and they're just, some of them are just amazing. And the idea, of course, is t for people to look at this uh, beautiful, uh, typically you'll see Mount Fuji or some other landscape scene, and it will call to mind uh, some of the great scenes in Japan. I think in the, in the background of this one that is pictured here in the center, it's uh, the famous islands of uh, Matsushima uh, in uh, uh, Miyagi Prefecture near Sendai, uh, which is just a, a beautiful collection of, of little islands, but, and it's a very famous. It's one of the scenes of, of three great scenes of scenic beauty in Japan. So you get clean, then you sit in the water, and you soak and the water is generally pretty doggone hot and the idea of sitting in the tub other than the fact that it's relaxing and enjoyable sitting in hot water uh, there are there's good evidence that the japanese receive health benefits from uh, soaking completely immersing themselves in uh, hot water at just their head exposed uh, it improves there's evidence that it improves circulation and such and you will go in and you sit and you just soak for a reasonable period of time then you get out rinse yourself off one more time and then you're ready to go uh, here we can see another uh, bathhouse so you can see to the left you can see the places where you scrub and get clean and in the right underneath the that beautiful hand-painted mural of mount fuji you can see a uh, a tub uh, which is going to be that's pretty deep that's probably two or three feet deep of, of water. So you can actually get in and have a full soak and it's going to be pretty doggone hot. Each location sets their temperature differently. Each location does some different things with their, their, their water, um, but it is generally pretty doggone hot. The Japanese like their water hot. Okay, we're also gonna talk about snack bars because we talked about that they move into a snack bar Snack bars are very common in Japan. There are 70,000 of them in the country by uh, the best estimate that I was able to find. And snack bars, so that means there's more snack bars in Japan than there are uh, convenience stores. And there's a heck of a lot of convenience stores. Snack bars, they do tend to be more distributed in Western Japan than in Eastern Japan, but you can definitely find them in Eastern Japan as well. And a, what makes a snack bar a snack bar, other than the fact that it says snacku on it, as you, if you can read Japanese, it says on many of the signs, it says snacku. Sometimes it says it in katakana, sometimes it says it in hiragana. It, it, you know, there's, there's a lot of positioning uh, going on here of, of how they're, they're labeling themselves. A snack bar, the concept of a snack bar, basically grew up uh, after the World War II. Snack bars were... The, the government wanted everybody to be home by midnight. And so they made drinking establishments close at midnight. But the workaround for that was for clubs that were small. Generally, they had 20 seats or less. Usually, I think it's 12 or less. And I think it's slightly different municipality to municipality. But it's very, very small. It serves a small amount of food, at least officially, so that it's serving snacks, they were allowed to stay open until like 3 a.m. or something like that. So if you're out on the town, uh, you're Japanese, 
year, particularly if you are a salary man, if you're a working man, you've been out, you've been drinking, you go to a snack bar, a snack bar, you can continue to drink alcohol after the bars, main bars and clubs are closed. It's a much more intimate setting. Uh, it's generally run, the owner of the snack bar is generally an older woman in her 40s, 50s, 60s. She might be single, she might be uh, a divorced person, she might be uh, someone who for, you know, owning a snack bar, some people who own snack bars, they've just always wanted to own a snack bar, but in some cases, people who own snack bars, this is making the best out of a life that didn't go exactly the way that they wanted it to, that, that they have had some issues in life and maybe they're not, particularly for women, something didn't go, you know, in the fairy tale pattern. Uh, I'm, I'm trying to express this in the most, uh, the kindest and most sympathetic way that I, that I can, uh, because they, you know, in some cases they, they just enjoy it. Uh, but in a lot of cases, it's, it's people who haven't really, they haven't dreamed of owning a snack bar for all of their lives because while you can make decent money, um, running a snack bar and snack bars, the majority of snack bar owners are actually women, uh, who either they're in a situation where they don't have a breadwinner in the house anymore, or, well, that's basically it, is they don't have a breadwinner in the house anymore. Men prefer to go to these snack bars. Women are welcome to go as well, of course, but you'll find the staff of a snack bar. I've never been in a snack bar that had a uh, male staff, maybe a bartender, tops. And usually if that was the case, the bartender was like the the, the mama son's son. It, very, very unusual. Generally, they're, they're staffed by women, they're owned by women, and they're able to skirt the legal restrictions by staying open uh, until three o'clock because they officially serve food. Uh, that means that they'll, they'll have some food available if a government inspector comes by. Uh, but whether a gourmet snack, well, actually some of them, I guess, have, have now chosen to uh, try to uh, enter that space as well. But typically it was not a place where you went to get really wonderful, delicious food. It was a place that you went to have a drink, to sing some karaoke, and to talk with a sympathetic person about your troubles. Um, and most snacks, uh, they're not places that people just roll into. You, you tend to develop a regular snack food that you go to. And as you'll see from the film, the snack bar uh, becomes uh, an important uh, place. Now, we're going to talk a little bit about, about traditional Japanese homes. Uh, when I say traditional Japanese homes, this is what pops into most people's minds. That's not typical at all all. That is it. It's traditional style, yes, but if someone lived in a house like this, they would be very, very wealthy. This is not a common home layout for the average Japanese person. Uh, as wonderful and beautiful as it is, it's, it's not, it's like thinking all Americans live in mansions. That's not what happens. A traditional Japanese home is more like this. It doesn't have central heat, so you can see on the left, there is a kerosene uh, stove that is used for heating in the winter. Most people deal with the low humidity and excess heat problems by putting a kettle with water on top of the kerosene here. So you have hot water all day long, so you can have tea or you can have soup, uh, many different uh, creative uses for hot water. Uh, the, it's not the safest for sure, but uh, you know, this is something that Japanese people are, are used to. Uh, and in the wintertime, the process of uh, going to the gasorin stando, the gas station, and getting kerosene in a large container and bringing it home to heat your home, very, very common uh, 
throughout the country, uh, even more so in colder northern climes. Okay, moving across the top, we see a Butsudan. Uh, this is maybe a little bit more typical of a Butsudan. Um, still pretty lavish. Um, what your Butsudan is going to look like is going to depend first. Is your family Buddhist? Uh, most Japanese families are Buddhist, although maybe not exclusively Buddhist. They're Buddhist and something else. Some are exclusively Buddhist. Uh, but that's basically a small Buddhist. Uh, it will typically have either a, a sacred uh, relic or a scroll inside, and it gives one a place to pray um, uh, and meditate daily to the Buddha. Uh, and that is typically located in the tokonoma or next to the tokonoma uh, where we saw the, the body laying in rest. Um, where people sleep, I love this photo. <laughs> the guy's sleeping on the floor and the dogs are sleeping on the bed. But you can also see from it that uh, there's not a whole lot of space, uh, that space is definitely at a premium. And uh, that's not atypical either. Um, I'm going to then move down to the lower row. You can see this is the formal room. Everybody, not everybody, but a lot of people will have a washitsu, a, a Japanese style room that does look more like what we saw on the previous page. And you can see here the, the tokonoma where you have a, you'll have a scroll. Uh, typically, you might also have a, an ikebana display or some family treasures on display. And this is for a formal sitting room. Uh, for the reception of guests and for important occasions. Uh, a kitchen. Um, this is not my mother-in-law's kitchen, but it kind of looks like it. I'm probably going to get in trouble for that. Um, you can see, again, a premium on space. You can see lots of low, typically stainless steel counters. You can see a very small cooking top. There's a microwave. There's no oven. There's usually a very space, space um, economic use of space uh, refrigerator as well that'll have a whole lot of drawers on it. Um, and that's typically what a, a kitchen will look like. So uh, it's not these palatial uh, type kitchens with islands and all sorts of things that you see in, in America. It's, it's very much a space constraint, even for people who are fairly well off. And then finally, moving to the far right, uh, you can see this is a uh, this is actually listed as a rice store, but it looks like there's well maybe they are selling rice. Uh, I thought, first, I thought it was a bookstore, but it is the the Takahashiya uh, Kome Ten, so uh, or Mai Ten. The point that I want to get there is that traditionally in the countryside and in more traditional areas of major cities like Tokyo, you'll see a lot of houses slash businesses like this. The first floor is the store and the people live on the upper level or levels. And it's an incredibly, um, uh, an incredibly economical usage of space. People in order, you know, the commute to go to work, if you work for a large company, of course, you have to cram yourself onto the subway. But if you are, if your family owns a business, you probably live above your place of business. The overall tone of the film, so hopefully you understand those things and you know what to look forward to. Overall tone of the film, there's laughing, there's crying, obviously dead people. It, it's not Weekend at Bernie's. They're not going to be making fun of dead people. But it does deal with humanity and grief and uh, in some ways kind of the, the, the value of life itself. Uh, the setting is in the city of Sakata, which as I said is in Yamagata. Uh, you can see from the photos here, Sakata uh, is, it's right on uh, the coast of, of the uh, of the Japan Sea, and you can see immediately the mountains in the background, so it's sandwiched right between those two. Gets a great deal of snow in the winter, uh, very rural, very traditional, 
very beautiful old style houses. Um, there is a very famous uh, temple that is built into the hillside for the mountains above Sakata, and a very famous uh, section of hot springs, onsen, uh, that is not, none of these will be seen uh, in, in the film, but that's where they filmed it. So, a final thought, and I'm sorry that I've talked so long, but I hope you get got something useful out of it. Final thought that I think, this is a quote that I came across, uh, and I feel that it kind of sums up the film. So I'll just read it to you, and then we'll end, and you can uh, enjoy the film. Everything we love is about to die, and that is why everything we love must be summed up with all the high emotion of farewell in something so beautiful we shall never forget it. And that's by Michel Leyris. Um, I don't want to give away anything in the film, but I think that this quote uh, summarizes uh, the film uh, quite well. Uh, so that's all I'm going to say for now. Uh, I hope you've enjoyed it. I hope you've got some uh, things to look for, things to understand. And we will meet on the other side after you have watched it and hopefully enjoyed uh, a wonderful Japanese meal to go with your film. I would personally suggest, although it doesn't get super gruesome, uh, I would think it, for most people it would probably be best to eat the meal first and then watch the film rather than doing both simultaneously. But, you know, as you prefer. So thank you for listening and I look forward to seeing you live uh, after you have watched uh, Departures Okuribito. Yoroshiku o Oh, tanoshimi ni.